Uh, so with that said, was you in a weird position? And I don't really want to elaborate, but being that you knew him since Digital Underground and he had uh, beef with Big, was you ever in a weird position being cool with both of them? Or it was like, yo, bus, bus, he's neutral, whatever the case may be. You know how we was raised, Crack. You know when you know and you're friends with two people that are conflicting. You're supposed to be the neutralizer. You're supposed to be the one to try to do whatever you can to squash it. You ain't supposed to pick no side. I'm not going to lie. I was closer to Big, even though I knew Pop first because I went to school with Big. I was in Big's home. Mm -hmm. I hug and kiss Big's mother. She hugs mm -hmm. and kisses me. You know, C's and all of them. We all, we grew together. Mm. You know, I knew Pac, but I haven't been in Pac's home. I, you know, I don't know the late, great, beautiful of Fanny Shakur, his mom. I, you know, we didn't have the same interaction based on us not living in the same proximity and space. So, you know, the, the circumstances is what created my relationship dynamic to be much stronger with Big and D-Rock and Kim and C's and the whole Junior Mafia, Biggie's moms. You know, me and Diddy, you know, that's one of my closest friends in the world. So, you know, and we was all on this side. You know, we was seeing each other crossing paths. So it, it was it was really tough for me to be in the middle of that. I mean, it was also like, when I saw Pac and Q-Tip had beef. Um, tribe. I never knew this. This is a joker moment. This is a <laughs> joker <laughs> moment. I never knew yeah, Pac and Q-Tip had beef. Yeah, Pac and Q-Tip had a very serious and a very intense beef. Like, thank you, Gonzalo. Um, this is during the time when I'm shooting higher learning movies. Right? We talking like 93, 92. And Source Awards, before they started to air on television, was at that same location um, at the Paramount Theater in Madison Square Garden. Mm -hmm. At least that's what it was called at the time, I believe. Mm -hmm. This is the same stage where Suge Knight tried to dish puff at that Source Awards. So this particular Source Awards, I believe, was the one or two of them before that particular moment, right? So me, Tupac, Omar Epps, we were staying in the Oakwood Apartments, which is the fully furnished apartments in L.A. on... Hollywood Boulevard in Fuller. I stayed there before. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about, right? So in this particular crib, it's, it's, it's like buildings full of fucking fully furnished apartments. Pac was in one floor. Omar Epps was on another floor. I'm on my floor. We bouncing back and forth to each other cribs the whole time we out there shooting movies. And Tupac, during this time frame, had to go to New York because he was performing at this particular Source Awards. So this is when we was all performing off of that tapes, crack. Mm -hmm. So you know, once the motherfucking engineer press play on your DAT tape, it ain't like you could stop that shit and play. No, 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 you gotta right. go. You gotta go, right? <laughs> so Tribe was performing, no, Tribe was doing their acceptance speech for best group of the year. They had won the award for that that year at the source. And Tupac was supposed to be the, the next performance after their acceptance speech was complete and Pac got introduced, right? So somehow the production person, the stage production manager, wasn't paying attention to what was really happening. And the motherfucker ended up pressing play in the middle of the tribe acceptance speech. So Pac just comes out there performing 
all over their speech like he was shitting on their speech. You feel me? So that wasn't pot fault, but it looked like a flagrant pot dish. It looked like some pot shit. Right. It looked like a flagrant pot dish. Pot 101. Right. So, you know, and, and at the time, because Pac, you know, had this little rep of being a little bit of a loose cannon, it looked like, all right, here he go again, right? So the beef starts. Pac comes off the stage, tribe, they with Zulu Nation, and shit get crazy. So it ain't lead to no blows, but a, a, a pressure was was very intense between tribe and Pac at the time and they ended up fortunately not going to blows but they didn't walk away from that shit with the beef squashed mm. so it was going to lead to something if they crossed paths again and somebody didn't step in to intervene and mediate and try to put it to, to bed Pac came back to the Oakwood Apartments. And, and you he, there. Yeah, and I'm there. And he, he know my relationship with Q-Tip. So he gave me the call and said, you got to come check me real quick. So I come in, I pull up on Pac. When I pull up on Pac, we ain't even talk about it, by the way. I'm just, I, I get to his apartment and we in there chilling and he actually got mad blood all over the place. And and he, he had an MPC... 60 beat machine in his apartment and it was looping this Isley Brothers sample and he had wrote about three, four songs to the same sample for different records, which was confusing to me because I never saw that like, I write one song to a beat, I'm not writing a different song to the same beat Pop wrote three or four songs to this same sample and we blowing tree and you know, I, I ain't want to seem anxious to know what he was talking about because, you know, it's also the vibe. The, we hanging around, we blowing tree, we just bobbing and chilling. So it almost was like he forgot to talk to me about what he called me to talk to him for because he had got caught up in writing these songs. Mm -hmm. So I eventually said to him, you, you, you wanted to holler at me about something? And he go, oh, yeah. So, you know, this is what happened with me and Q-Tip, and I know you and Q-Tip is like brothers, and it wasn't my fault. They pressed play on the deck. I fucking hear my song. I go out there. I got to do what I'm doing. I didn't, you know, I'm focusing on the shit that I got to do. So I wasn't even really paying attention to the fact that they was doing their acceptance speech. And when they approached me on some shit, I didn't know what it was about. I need Q-Tip to know I wasn't on no bullshit. Like, I got unbelievable respect for Tip and Fife and Tribe. So could you get us on the phone? Because he ain't have Tip number. So I called Tip, and I, I, I talked to Tip about Pac getting on the phone, wanting to talk to him. Him and Pac spoke. And what's the dude that used to be on BT with the light brown eyes? and said Donnie Simpson or something? Donnie Simpson, the, Donnie the Simpson. green eye guy. What? He was still on BT at the time. He's still fly, by the way. He works at a... Radio station in D.C., he's still, he's the Billy D's of the game. He's still fly. Oh, that's he's a fact. He's still on the radio in D.C. And, and, he, and he got the motherfucking um, Billy D. Williams voice for real. He, he definitely, <laughs> <laughs> big up to Donnie Simpson, legend, legend, legend. So Tip and Pop spoke. They actually squashed the shit. And they were now trying to strategize a way to get on BET and do a public truce. And it didn't get to happen. Interestingly enough, during that same time frame, Pac, this is when Jack the Rapper was still popping. You know all about Jack the Rapper, correct? In Atlanta. In Atlanta. Jack That's the Rapper. That's when I met Tupac. Right. So Jack the Rapper comes, and Pac was redoing. He was fully restoring, a, I think, like a six- 67 Chevy Impala or a 64, something like that. And he had it fully done up. He shipped the shit down to Atlanta. He goes down there. 
couple days pass and shit, you hear about this police shooting with these off-duty cops that Tupac was involved in. Tupac comes back to L.A. And when he gets back to L.A., me and Omar pulled up on him, check him and shit. And then, the, you know, we was vibing for a minute and then Omar left and I stayed. The difference was, you know, Pac was still on his, put a loop on on the MPC, write a bunch of songs of that shit, steam a bunch of weed. But this time he was a lot more paranoid because he thought as a result of that situation transpiring down there, you know, the police is the whole United States. The niggas are put a calling in a different state and they police friends or brothers in the next city are come and see you. He felt something like that was going to happen as a result of what transpired in Atlanta, in L.A. So he just was on some super paranoid, constantly looking out the window shit. He got his ratchet closet right. Like he really thought somebody was coming to get him at that point. But just watching Pac go through all of these phases, I'm saying all of this to say the situation with him and Big and the discomfort for me was Pac had gotten to a place where there wasn't really no talking to him. There really wasn't no ability to mediate the situation. He had gotten a little too far gone with what he had surrounded himself with becoming a part of the death row family. And, um, you know, there was yeah, other... I know. When I first had beef for 50 Cent, could nobody talk me off that mountain. Like, I was okay. like, it was all smoke. I lost friends. If a friend of mine worked with him or anything, yeah, I was like on some beyond bullshit. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I know it could get to a place like that.